join us in singing the Philippine National Anthem to be immediately followed by our prayer. Kababayan ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang magiliw, pero sa silakanan, alam ng puso sa titik mo'y buhay. Upang hinihang, tuyag ka ng magiging, sa manlulupin, di ka pasisigil sa nagatak. Sa gitna ng pagkalito at takot na bumabagabag sa amin, balutin ninyo kami ng yakap ng inyong pagmamahal at proteksyon. Palakasin po ninyo ang aming mga katawan. Patuloy na patnubayan ng aming pamilya at mga mahal sa buhay. Tulungan at gabayan po ninyo ang aming mga lider sa kanilang mga desisyon. Pagkaloban ninyo ng lakas ang mga frontliners sa kanilang pagsugpo at pagharap sa karamdamang ito. Aming Ama na pinagmumula ng aming kalakasan, kayo po ang magkaloob ng kagalingan sa lahat ng patuloy na lumalaban sa sakit na ito. Kayo po ang aming sandigan at takbuhan. Sa inyo po ang aming buong pagtitiwala. Dahil alam namin sa gitna ng krisis na ito, hindi ninyo kami pababayaan.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the sixth episode of Kagitingan, the Tivao Historical Webinar Series 2021, entitled Negros During the War. I am Nico Oreiro. And I'm Felicia Lloris Lanya. We are your hosts for today. Before anything else, allow me to acknowledge the presence of the following. Tivao Administrator Yusek Ernesto G. Carolina. Tivao Deputy Administrator Raul D. Caballes. National Historical Commission of the Philippines. PVD Vice President, Mr. Mike Villarreal, Mount Samat FDS Administrator, Mr. Francis Initorio, Dr. May Bridget Bernadel L. Villordon, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Siliman University, Dr. Neil Marshall Santillan from the University of the Philippines, Dr. Jose Romel B. Hernandez from the De La Salle University, Dr. Archie B. Rezos from the University of San Tomas and Professor Marlon F. Agoy Agoy, MP from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Right now, we have about 54 participants here in Zoom. And for those who were unable to pre-register, we are currently being broadcasted via Facebook Live on the official Facebook page of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. Before we officially begin the program, here are some reminders for all of us. In case there are lags, just stay on and wait for it to load again. Zoom attendees are on mute to avoid background noise. If you have questions, you may use the message box for our Zoom attendees or use the comment section on the Facebook live stream. And after the webinar, the participants who registered are encouraged to answer the evaluation form. The link will be sent on their email. Now, just a quick recap of our last episode, which was held on April 15. Dr. Ricardo T. Jose retold to us the story of the infamous Bataan Death March and the Kagutingan that took place amidst the atrocities. We were also joined by Mr. Vicente Lim IV of the American Battle Monuments Commission with his presentation, Identify, Bury, and Honor, which presented to us the story of the Graves Registration Service and the Death March. As the great-grandson of Brigadier General Vicente Lim, he also told us the story of his great-grandfather's experience during the war. Finally, Dr. Marceli Marcelico Macapinlac Jr. demonstrated how to reconstruct the guerrilla movement in Southern Luzon utilizing the Brigadier General Francisco Licuanan Jr. Collection of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. In today's episode, we will be joined by another well-known scholar in the field of history, Silaman University's very own Dr. Earl Jude Paul L. Cleope, who will be sharing his presentation on the history of Negros during the Second World War. So without further ado, let us begin our program with an opening message to be given by the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences of the Siliman University, Dr. May Bridget Bernadel L. Villordon. It is with great joy for Silliman University to be part of this annual celebration of honoring and memorializing the heroic deeds of our Filipino war veterans during the Second World War. We are also equally proud that one of our distinguished professor here at the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Earl Jude Paul L. Clope is one of the highly sought expertise on historical accounts here in our region and across the country. We are one with the whole nation in commemorating this year's heroism and valor of our war veterans in observing the 79th Araw ng Kagitingan and the 2021 Philippine Veterans Week. With this year's theme, Tagitingan ay gawing gabay, pandemya ay mapagtatagumpayan. Along with the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office series of historical webinars are timely events as we face this ongoing battle against COVID-19. This unexpected situation prompted us to shift to the digital mode of learning through webinars and many other platforms. But this pandemic does not hinder us from continuing to learn and educating and enriching our knowledge about the Philippine military history and the World War II events. 
I am hopeful that this engagement will further promote the possibility of future research and collaboration among higher education institutions across the country. Your time, passion, and commitment to make these changes has helped us adopt the new way, the new normal. You have remained faithful to your mission and mandate, and I wish to acknowledge with gratitude for your hard work, patriotism, and love for our country. On behalf of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office and Suleiman University, I would like to welcome everyone. And in the spirit of friendship, openness, and sheer courage, I wish all of you a very productive day. Thank you very much. May God bless us all. Thank you very much, Dr. Villiordon, for your welcoming message. Now let us hear from Professor Marlon F. Agre Agre, MP, Chairperson of the Department of History, Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Isang makasaysayang araw sa ating lahat. Nitong mga nagdaang araw, napakinggan natin ang mga tagapagsalita na nagtalakay ng iba't ibang tema ng kabayanihan at katapangan ng mga bayani natin. At sa aking palagay, napapanahon ito dahil tayo ngayon ay humaharap sa ibang forma ng gera. Ang pagkakaroon ng lakas ng loob at tapang na ipinamalas ng mga bayani natin na lumaban sa pisikal ng gera ay masasabi natin mga katangian na dapat magamit natin sa krisis na kinakaharap natin ngayon. Kaya naman, napaka makabuluhan ang aktibidad na ito. On behalf of uh, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines Department of History, we extend our congratulations to the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office for making this project possible. We in PUP are one with PIVAO in educating our people about the past and instilling in them the value of realizing the truest sense of nationalism. Kaya naman, ipinapangako natin na patuloy tayong magiging katuwang ng inyong institusyon para sa pagsusulong ng kasaysayan. Again, congratulations to PIVAO. Mabuhay tayong lahat. of Siliman University. Dr. Earl Jude Paul Cleope is currently the Vice President for Academic Affairs of Siliman University in Dumaguete City. A man of big dreams, he followed the trail of his passion, education. He obtained his Bachelor of Science in Education major in Social Studies, minor in English in college. Back then, he was an active student, a leader, an athlete, and an achiever graduated as cum laude in 1987. He pursued greater excellence and took up his MA in history in Siliman University, after which his PhD in history at the University of Santo Tomas, where he graduated as summa cum laude in 1999. After pursuing higher education, he went back to Siliman University and first taught at the high school department and eventually transferred to the Department of History, where he became the chairperson for five years. In 2005, he was appointed as the director of instruction and later on became the dean of the College of Education. Yeah. Aside from being the vice president for academic affairs of Suleiman University, he is currently one of the commissioners of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. He was a technical working, working group member of the cultural mapping project of the National Commission for Culture and Art. He is also a member of the boards of the Philippine Studies Association Incorporation and a member of the advisory board of the Philippine National Historical Society. As a fruit of his passion for history and research, he authored the book entitled Bandit Zone, a history of the free areas of Negros Island during the Japanese occupation 
1942 to 1945. Currently, she is working on a book project about the maritime history of the Visayas and continues to study the Japanese occupation period in Negros Island. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Earl Jude Paul L. Cleope. Mayong hapon, kaninyong tanan. Greetings from Siliman University, Dumaguete City. Um, it's my honor to be part of this Kagitingan, the Pivao Historical Webinar Series. The title of my presentation is the Japanese account of the liberation of Negros Island. About 70, exactly around 76 years ago, um, the island was liberated from the Japanese by the combined forces of the guerrillas, Filipinos, and uh, the Americans. But what I'd like to share is the Japanese version, the Japanese version of the liberation of Negros to give us a kind of a different take and view of the Japanese occupation in the Philippines uh, in the context of our continuing quest to understand and appreciate these narratives of the heroism of the Filipino soldiers and American soldiers during the Japanese occupation. And so um, the reason why I was able to uh, develop this presentation, this paper, is because of uh, this person. He's actually a Silimanian alumnus who is doing well in Japan. And uh, when I was in Japan in 2000 for uh, doing my fellowship at the International Christian University, I chanced upon, upon these diaries of two soldiers who were assigned in Dumaguete and in Negros. Uh, but of course, at that time, uh, my Japanese was very poor. And uh, when I met this guy, uh, he decided to help me with the translation. So. Practically, it took about 12 or 13 years for the translation to happen. And so finally, in 2015, he visited me with his son, and he brought the rare pictures of the guy who wrote the book, and including the one and only copy of the book, which he also requested another Silimanian to translate to English. And so this one is actually the book now titled Nasunog Hill. And I, I opened it so you can actually see how it looked like. Uh, one half of it is in Japanese, in old Japanese, and with the picture of uh, Yamada, Corporal Yamada, and one half would be the English translation. So, um, and then another document <coughs> was the um, narratives of what we call as the, when after the war there was this investigation and uh, one of those investigated was a certain first lieutenant, Kume Pujitumi, who was also assigned in Negros. And out of that, uh, uh, Dr. Rico Jose was kind enough to give me the proceedings of the interrogation. <clears throat> so these are primary documents. And out of this, I'm able to piece together the Japanese account of the liberation of Negros. So as an introduction, um, Negros uh, was 
one of the last islands to be occupied by the Japanese uh, during the Japanese occupation. Uh, first, the Japanese landed and occupied Bacolod on the northern side. And then um, later, about five days later, on May 26, 1942, <laughs> Dumaguete was also um, occupied. And, of course, owing to the size and the archipelagic nature of the Philippines, uh, the Japanese forces were garrisoned only in vital strategic points and centers of the country. Now, this means that at the outset of the Japanese occupation, uh, Negros Island uh, was even one of those that was to be occupied last. And, of course, uh, the more important part of the island for the Japanese was the northern part. And that's the reason why uh, there was a concentration of the Japanese forces in Negros Occidental than Oriental. Uh, about 7,500 Japanese troops were assigned in the island by 1943, and only about a quarter of it was tasked to uh, man the southern sector. In the report, uh, in the American report, intelligence report, um, Japanese strength was placed at 9,969, of which 1,678 were assigned in South Negros and Sikihor Island. So, um, I'll, so the next map will <clears throat> point to you the occupied and the occupied areas. So you will see that a heavy concentration of the Japanese were really on the northern and on the northwestern uh, side. And very, very few were assigned in the south and southeastern side. <clears throat> so fast forward, with the return of General MacArthur, um, that would now be the focus of this paper. Uh, what happened uh, when MacArthur returned by October of 1944? So, um, again, um, take note that this was the situation of Negros uh, at the time of the Japanese occupation for the whole length of the Japanese occupation. So, you see here, all the Japanese occupation in red. And then the blue lines actually are the encampments of the guerrillas and the Filipino forces. And of course, you see here that this is Dumaguete and the neighboring towns and with all the <coughs> guerrilla and Filipino forces. And so... Um, now what we will do, what I'll try to walk you through is uh, the last few months of the occupation from the eyes of the um, Japanese. And so it said, it, the diary stated that um, by... MacArthur landed in October 1944. By November, um, guerrilla attacks were becoming more rampant and active. However, by December of 1944, because it was Christmas, there was also a lull. In fact, they said that uh, at the end of the year, uh, they, were, they felt so relaxed and peaceful. And the Japanese soldiers were able to visit their Filipino friends who invited them, even for Christmas dinner. And then after that, after the new year, there were now what we call a series of attacks. So you can see on the slide, uh, these are some supply route. These are uh, original scanned documents from the intelligence records and so by early part of 1945 especially by january 
the commander of the Japanese Army, the 174th Battalion, Colonel Satoshi Oye, declared that there should be a perimeter of four kilometers around Dumaguete. And beyond that, he calls it no man's land. It was intended to distinguish civilians and guerrillas. And of course, anyone who intruded <clears throat> into that buffer was subject to be executed. So this order was made to help the local re residents to vacate from the area and evacuate to safer places. At the same time, this declaration made it also easy for the Japanese defensive and <coughs> offensive activities. But from then on, um, there were now what we call as incessant attacks from the Filipinos. And in fact, I'd like to quote here that um, the Japanese were also having problems with food. And that's why they also ventured outside of that four kilometers <clears throat> to look for food. <clears throat> but the counterattacks of the Filipino forces intensified with uh, their newly recruited soldiers. And in fact, uh, according to the diaries, the guerrillas' front line was even situated just around 1,500 meters ahead of their defense. And thus, they could identify their campfire through the distance. Uh, in their observation, the guerrillas did not even keep their silence, even though they were aware of the Japanese presence nearby. This was because of their confidence that Japanese forces would not take offensive move anymore. Uh, it seemed that the guerrillas already, already anticipated that whenever they attacked the Japanese, they would just drive the guerrillas about one kilometer back and then return to their original positions. <laughs> this was done because of the danger of being cut off if they attempted to pursue the guerrillas further. Uh, though the Japanese forces were aware that the unit near their camp was not, was not an official military establishment, but, but was just an independent guerrilla force without backing supports, yet they were afraid that the longer the encounter continues, they would have a problem with their food supply because the guerrillas sat on their food supply depot territory. <laughs> and so, um, so this, this was the situation. And then another problem was their weaponry. Um, they were, uh, the, the documents would say that uh, uh, they, they just had, they were only equipped with rifles and 11th light machine guns and some weapons that they were able to take from the enemy forces, such as the carbon automatic rifle. Um, they did not have enough guns to supply to each soldier that some of them had to be on the battlefield with bare hands. <clears throat> in fact, one company that was on duty at the Maguete area was not equipped with any gun nor weapon yet, but they were stationed to defend and fight against the attacking forces. So that was the situation. So by February of 1945, um, this was the thing that really shook the Japanese in Dumaguete. Um, a high-speed boat appeared and started bombarding the city of Dumaguete from the early morning hour. <clears throat> and um, since the landing of the U.S. forces in Leyte, Japanese forces had been under uncontrollable defeats that all the forces in Leyte retreated and scattered to the surrounding islands with a firm resolution of revitalizing the formation force of a resistance against the U.S. forces. Uh, and because of this, there was even a group of nine survivors from Leyte, headed by a certain Lieutenant Ide, that drifted towards the shores of Dumaguete that some of them were unable to stand and walk due to the excessive exhaustion. And uh, 
Then another, then afterwards, um, Colonel Watanabe of the 35th and his followers arrived also in Dumaguete and the whole Japanese contingent by February that they should move out from Dumaguete. And they chose the mountain range uh, west of the city. So they went into uh, the, what they called the Kamin Kunyama, or they labeled, labeled it as the Divine Mountain. And uh, they moved to the western highest mountain called Mount Talinis and for a defensive position. And so that was February 1945. But by March, uh, the situation worsened for them and um, they changed their tactic. Now, the tactic was to conduct enemy movement uh, of scouting and um, what they will now do is to have penetration attacks because they had problems with food. And this was the defining moment for them because there were squads that were formed that were called the suicide squads. Um, uh, the thing was, the strategy was, groups of four or five men were placed at intervals of about 300 meters along the narrow ridges. And whenever the action became too severe, the front groups would retreat to the rear and had the next group hold off the enemy as long as possible. Uh, this plan of action was carried out because of the small force and the danger of any concentration of forces being wiped out by uh, artillery fire. And uh, at night, infiltration squads of about three men were sent out to penetrate the American and Filipino lines down below. So that's the next slide. Um, uh, this is actually Mount Talinis, where they chose to have their last stand. Okay, this picture is taken from what we now call as the Japanese shrine, but this is the area that they really had their their last stand for about five to six months. Okay, and um, the war situation turned acutely uh, disadvantageous for the Japanese forces that um, they move, you know, families of Japanese citizens, uh, local citizens, including the governor uh, uh, and some dignitaries uh, went with the Japanese in their retreat to the mountains. And uh, the elevation of that area, this area is around 800 to around 1,400 meters, so more than 2,000 uh, feet. So um, with this, what happened was um, from, from here, the next slide will show to you the kind of um, planes that um, attack the airport and even Dumaguete. Now, the side note for this is that even while they were at the, air, uh, at the airport, Dumaguete airport, and of course the Japanese were mostly at the uh, Siliman campus, when the MacArthur uh, arrived with the return of MacArthur, there were also what we call as incessant bombing raids. And this created a problem for them because they also had a new arrival of very young boys who are called boy pilots. These are trained pilots in Japan, but when they arrived in Dumaguete because there were planes there, most of the planes were destroyed by this kind of the F-6 Hellcat. And in fact, uh, one of these, one of the pilots took a photo when the bombing <coughs> was done. So you can see clearly that 
uh, when they had a run at the Dumaguete airfield, most of the planes and most of the airport were destroyed. So that was the situation. And then, of course, you now have this problem. Okay? So um, in the liberation of Negros, um, you have to take a look at how the Japanese moved. Um, of course, if you take a look at the, the place, uh, there was Dumaguete, where they had <coughs> settled and made their headquarters. And then when the Americans liberated Leyte and subsequently were able to overrun the airport and, you know, the guerrillas also were emboldened to attack the Japanese, they decided to transfer to Cebulan. And then from here, they scampered away because they realized that they have problems with food. They transferred next to the highest mountain, and this is Mount Talinis. And so for the next three months, they were holed up here uh, while trying to fend off the, the, the American and Filipino forces. And it was in this situation that the, the, the fierce battles that were fought to liberate this side of Negros Island really took a toll. And so um, by April of 1945, by April 26 to be exact, the city of Dumaguete was liberated. <clears throat> but of course, the Japanese were not already in the city. Um, it was said that the American fleet of around 40 ships uh, landed and um, it was also this time that most of those who were around the vicinity of Dumaguete decided to withdraw towards the mountains. But then again, this is now the, the part. Uh, the unit commanders left several suicide squads in Dumaguete in order to, you know, hold um, hold of the line while the most of the forces went to the mountains. So when the Americans uh, landed in Dumaguete, um, the next round was uh, a series of bombardment by a destroyer and a cruiser. And after that, American planes, uh, naval planes bombed and strapped the units as they withdrew up to uh, the Mount Talinis area. And um, we read from the diary that uh, because of this, Three of the companies uh, at this time were also detached from their units and were sent to Bohol. And so what they had was just the air training support and cast away naval personnel in combat. And this was the situation now. In their retreat, they only had about 230 rounds per men at the time. And with the addition of these poorly trained replacements, as the corporal uh, noted, uh, they did not have the fighting force anymore. And so after capturing Dumaguete, the Allied forces now will pursue the Japanese to the mountains. And um, the special squad of Japanese soldiers will now take the brunt of this assault. Um, what happened now was that these special quads, squads tried to do and tried to hold up, you know, all these terrains and things like that. And um, the Subsequently, the combined American and Filipino army forces proceeded. 
And by May, so that was April, by May, uh, they were now at the base of the mountains. But still, they could not, uh, they could not take the, the mountain. There was still heavy hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And um, if you take a look, this is where there's a lot of um, these, these are, there's a lot of accounts from um, Cur um, Corporal Ramada that most of his loyal friends were, uh, were lost. And um, what happened was they had problems now with food and especially with salt by May. They really ran out of supply. And so by, if that's May, by June of 1945, uh, again, they tried to, the Japanese forces organized themselves into attack squads of five members that were assigned to carry out suicide missions and were given five days of food ration per squad. The squads were ordered to make penetrating patrols and were instructed not to return to the base camp until their five days of patrol. On many occasions, the Japanese squad would meet a platoon of allied forces made up of 30 persons. So it's a five against 30 uh, persons with about eight local guides. So uh, the, the Japanese squads ended up retreating into the interior <laughs> due to their inferior firepower and limited ammunition. And of course, to compound the problem, Constant bombardment from Allied planes took a heavy toll among their comrades that they had to build more trenches and of to protect uh, from the, uh, to, in order to protect them from the bombing. So even up to this area now, uh, you can still see a lot of trenches, foxholes, and embarkations by the Japanese. And sustained massive artillery bombardments, air attacks, and infantry assaults compelled them to abandon all positions and to, re to, to retreat some more. And the dense jungle slowed their movements and until uh, they really were already at, at the top of the mountain, so to speak. And by, uh, this was the time that um, they, uh, they, they, but June, and so uh, by July, uh, they continued, they continued to hold. At the same time, the Allied forces had problems uh, with the accessibility because of the dense jungle terrain. And there was a lull by July, but finally by August uh, 15, um, they were able to pick up through, uh, over the radio uh, of what happened in Japan, uh, especially Japan's acceptance of the post-dump declaration. But uh, only the officers and some knew about this. Then finally, Colonel Oye uh, decided that they will now surrender. And so subsequently, uh, this is the is interesting thing a second lieutenant by the name of Shibusawa, who, who was traveling alone, undetected from Bacolod, arrived in Mount Alinis. And uh, he brought a message from the 14th Army commander, um, General Yamashita, that officially ordered an end to the war. And so Colonel Oye, uh, ordered some officers and non-commissioned officers to Dumaguete to contact the Allied forces. So now you see that there was still this connection between the Japanese officers and some loyal Filipino friends because they still were able to penetrate the American line by passing the Filipino and guerrilla forces. And so by September, early September 5, uh, American planes dropped some su surrender fillers and there was an agreement between the Japanese, especially Lieutenant Shubukawa and the American officers that 
uh, the surrender will happen. And so on September 22, um, so again from here, from September 22, you see this place there, Zambongita, on the southernmost tip. That's where they, they went and to surrender to the army forces there. Again, they surrendered only to the American forces. So, so the next slides are important photographs that documented the surrender. Um, so Colonel Oi and his men um, uh, surrendered uh, and it says that he was with 890 uh, men okay and so these are snapshots in the slides of how they were processed and that's Colonel Oye with his staff and then the Okay, conferring with the staff. Then they had their last formation where they had their symbolic uh, surrender of the swords. And of course, this was the defining uh, picture when Colonel Satoshi Oye hands over his sword to Colonel Wilson, the commanding officer of the U.S. 503rd Parachute Regiment of the U.S. 8th Army on September 22. 1945 at Ginsuan Bridge, Nasigid sa Buangita, Negros Oriental. And um, of course, um, with the surrender, it might interest uh, the audience here in the virtual world that uh, this is the talk. Um, in the slides, you will see that uh, this was the, the strength of the Japanese forces after the American landing. In other words, uh, just, you know, during the American landing. So they had around 1,405 men. Uh, but of course, you take note that of these men, 350 are part of the 31st Air Training Unit these flying young boys, newly trained. And you have castaways and ship survivors, you have 150. So that was the force. And right after the war, in the, in the surrender, you'll have this, because of the 890, some of them were civilians. And so this is the, 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 the statistics that was uh, offered. And you will see that of the 1,405, uh, 628, almost uh, half uh, were war casualties. But the one that really had the biggest casualty was the second company uh, that had lost almost everyone. Only 11 survived. About 95% were. This was where where the suicide squads, uh, you know, came from. And so, if we if we follow the diary of Yamada, um, he went back to Japan. Uh, he was able to go back to Japan after after his imprisonment. Uh, he was placed in a labor camp. But uh, in the diary, you will see that his friends in Dumaguete even visited him uh, while he was in prison. Then eventually, uh, he was sent to Tacloban. And after that, um, he, he was transferred. And on October 7, that year, he returned to Japan. And so after that, 
uh, Corporal Ramada Yamada went back and eventually in 1974 established the Japanese shrine, now called the Japanese Amity Shrine. So uh, as a way of a conclusion, um, it must be underscored that from the outset, the Japanese had already failed in their war of entry. From the very start, they failed to get the sympathy of the Filipino people. And in fact, all throughout the war in Asia and the Pacific, the key to victory is maintaining ample logistics and accessibility, which evolved a tremendous transportation and communication network. Evidently, the Japanese could not sustain the war effort. In the Philippines, they were hungry enough to turn to thievery. And of course, likewise, hygienic practices were not adhered to, so skin diseases, body lice, and other illnesses were rampant. And subsequently, the ominous signs of the Japanese defeat caused tremendous problems for the civilians, with the former now preparing to make their last stand. And uh, what happened was that uh, the, what the, the phrase now would be, from hunter to prey. They became the prey. Ultimately, with the American landing, the prey and the Japanese found themselves in a strange situation. Uh, they, uh, they ended up as the new prey, as, I said, as I've said, seeking refuge in the hills and now the mountains they formerly labeled as bandit zones because they now became the subject of a massive manhunt operations of the combined U.S., Filipino, and guerrilla forces. <clears throat> and so it is clear that uh, most, as I've said, it is clear that most of the casualties of the Japanese forces in Southern Negros occurred in the last months of the war, with the second company suffering the worst at 95%. Uh, this was because this was the company that was ordered to provide defensive actions by providing what they call as suicide squads. And in the account of First Lieutenant Kumi Fujitumi, in the interrogation, he narrated that 28 of this mission did not return. So if you have 28 times 5, that's a lot of Japanese soldiers. So moreover, most of the forces assigned in Southern, Southern Negros were not trained to fight. Out of the 1,405, there were about 520 who belonged to the infantry battalion and 350 personnel were actually boy pilots who had no planes to fly and the rest were support groups. On another plane, uh, despite the violence, one can also draw an inspiring story of friendship uh, between Corporal, Corporal Yamada and his Filipino friends and many other Japanese soldiers with other families. In fact, in the end, after 30 years, collaborative efforts between the surviving Japanese soldiers and Filipino war veterans, businessmen, and politicians led to a movement of Japanese war veterans and their families to retrieve the bones of their fallen comrades, which were scattered in the area of the last stand, that were left and hidden in the many foxholes, bunkers, and tunnels they made during the war. Uh, they wanted to get the bones so that they could put them together in one place so that those fallen soldiers who served their country could be honored because honoring a dead relative is a tradition all Japanese follow. <clears throat> so as I've said, on November 24, 1974, Mr. Hideo Harada came to Negros Oriental and to fulfill his mission along with co-veterans uh, Shirai, Yushia Shirai, Hideo Miyahara, and Nozawa Minuro, and some others, and relatives of the fallen Japanese soldiers, and excavated the bones buried in the area in Barangay Salbang. So they went through old and moss covered tunnels and cave, which was littered with bones of their comrades in Salbang and other places where they had gunfights. The remains of the soldiers were then cremated in Palimpinon, Valencia on December 17, 1974, and the ashes were brought to Japan and distributed to the Japanese soldiers' relatives. And the memorial shrine of the Japanese was conceived during the cremation ceremony 
and uh, and because of that, by April 1977, the memorial that you see now uh, uh, was put up. Uh, in fact, uh, they called the place Senzan. Uh, or in, in, in Cebuano, it's Nasunug. It's the Nasunug, Nasunugan, because of the heavy bombardment. But the Japanese called it Senzan, or another term for Divine Mountain. And it was erected on a plateau on Nasunug Ridge, the northeastern shoulder of Mount Talinis in Sagbang. And uh, the shrine, uh, now you see, is an eight-meter concrete tower with white marble finish. And uh, the the tri-sided lower, uh, the tri-sided monument uh, represent the American Liberation Forces from the 164th Regiment, later replaced by the 503rd, the Filipino guerrilla units of the 75th and the 77th Infantry, and the Japanese Imperial Forces of the 174th. Uh, it serves now as a sacred memory and difference to an act of mourning for those who died during World War II. And in the inscription, which was also stolen, now you can you don't have the inscription anymore, um, in Japanese and in, in English, uh, I'd like to quote, this Filipino-Japanese American Amity Memorial Shrine marks the easternmost portion of the main defense site that runs west along the two ridges converging on the top of this mountain range where the main elements of the Japanese Imperial Army of the 174th Independent Unit under the command of Colonel Satoshi Oi, properly positioned in a series of bunkers, dugouts, foxholes, and tunnels linked by connecting trenches, had battled the combined forces of the 164th American Division, United States Army, and the guerrilla elements of the 73rd Provisional Division of the 7th Military District of Negros Island. The Battle of the Ridges commenced in, the earnest, in earnest on April 27, 1945, and by the early part of June 1945, the combined Filipino-American forces captured these ridges from the Japanese defenders. The remnants of the Japanese Imperial forces withdrew from these ridges and finally surrendered by the roadside north of the town of Sambuangita on September 22, 1945, signaling the end of the hostilities in Negros Oriental. And so with that, um, that's actually the, the liberation from the um, Japanese perspective of the story because we also have the official narratives from the Filipino guerrilla forces, from the Filipino army forces, and from the American forces. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation. And I hope uh, my presentation adds value and contributes to the understanding of the World War II in the Philippines. Thank you very much and good afternoon. very, very much, sir. We now open the floor for the questions from the audience and the public. For our FB viewers, please place your questions on the comments section. And for the Zoom participants, please place your questions on our chat box. Okay. We invite Dr. Cleope to please unmute. Okay. Sir, I believe we have our first question. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Why is it important to discuss the experience of the Japanese garrison unit assigned in Philippines during the war, sir? Um, this is because as we now celebrate the liberation uh, period, it is also important to know the story from the other side. Uh, this will give us a holistic view of the whole phenomenon. Okay. okay, sir, thank you very much. Next question, sir. What is the difference between the Japanese occupation of Luzon 
and the Japanese and in Central Visaya? Um, as I said uh, early in the presentation, um, Negros Island was one of the the last islands to be occupied by the Japanese, and in the occupation, uh, only the northern and northwestern side of the island, which is in the Bacolod area, uh, had the most number of Japanese. This is because uh, vital supplies like alcohol from, from sugar and food was in the area. And so just like in many areas in the Philippines, and especially also in Mindanao, there were a lot of areas that had no Japanese uh, concentration. But uh, when we take a look at the war, of course, it is but natural that we really focus on the areas that were occupied. But if you take a look at the whole country, and this is now, this should be the new trend of the study of the Japanese occupation. There were also areas, and in fact, even in this side of Negros, there were many Filipinos who did not even saw a single Japanese, not until after the war. And so it's important to take a look and study this phenomenon because like in Negros, uh, supply, the food chain and everything was the Mindanao Negros run through sailboats. Uh, there was even correspondence, uh, the school, Siliman, had what we call as jungle university and lessons. Although now we have modules in depth, ed, but that actually happened during the war. Professors uh, send their uh, lessons by sailboat to Mindanao and students will also uh, send back through this route. So uh, this, th there are a lot of things that we'll be able. And of course, as I've said, uh, the study of the Japanese occupation should not be generalized. What happened in Luzon exactly was not what happened in Mindanao and in the Visayas. So it's really important that uh, since this is a national thing that uh, we also consult and listen to local historians because uh, that's, that's the thing that will really make the understanding complete and more holistic. Thank you very much, sir. We have another question. Was Colonel Absede also the political leader of the free areas of Negros? No, he was not. He was actually the military leader. Um, before the war, he was the commandant of the ROTC unit of Siliman University. And then, of course, because when the Japanese occupied, uh, so many commanders would like to be command commander. <laughs> you know, they would take command all over the place. So that's the reason why. Uh, General MacArthur, when he learned of this from Australia, had to send somebody, uh, Major Villamore, to once and for all settle this. So many command uh, commanding officers in the region, and he appointed uh, Colonel Absede. And of course, uh, after that, Absede created what we call as uh, deputy district. So the political leader was Monte Libano. I've said he was the seventh military commander in the seventh military district. So he was not a politician. Okay, next question, sir. This one is from Rafael Crescencio Tan Jr. Fourth sure. Dumaguete, Fourth Dumaguete City Veterans Post Liberation Day in Dumaguete is celebrated every April 26, but actual surrender took place on September 22, 1945. Is this correct? Yes, uh, Colonel Judge Stan, that is correct. Uh, Dumaguete had its formal liberation in April, but as I've said, it took a while for the final surrender to happen. So from uh, April, you have, uh, that's why it's very important to take a look at the countdown from May, June, July, August, September, five months after that the final surrender happened. Okay, thank you for that answer. And also, were there instances that Japanese married local women to be integrated to local community and escape persecution of advancing American forces? Um, in the diary, there was no mention of any marriage. Um, I was actually looking for that. It just mentioned friends. Uh, but uh, um, it still has to be studied because 
I know there were in in uh, there were in uh, what we call in in Mindanao. Ah, yeah. There's even one diary of a Silimanian whose parents. He's actually Japanese, but he's a Silimanian, and he. Yeah, there's one that actually it's a, in one diary, a local diary. He married a uh, Filipina in Shapon. And uh, yes, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's one uh, Japanese who married a Filipina, but he fought with the uh, guerrillas because he's a Silimanian. Uh, first, there was distrust. So it's 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 probably in the ne- if we have the next, uh, I'll I'll share the diary and his story also in the platform. A Japanese who fought against the Japanese. Thank you, sir. We will be looking forward to that. Next question from Rodolfo Jul Jr. Lokstein. In your personal opinion, what do you think is the reason why these Japanese soldiers surrendered to the American forces and not to the Philippine army and why? Um, in the diary, it's very, very clear that uh, they feared for their lives. Uh, they, they feared for their lives. They cannot trust that the Filipinos will... Uh, adhere to the conventions of the war and of course without the knowledge and this is another area uh, the negotiation just like what happened in 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 occidental negotiations were being done through american and the japanese lines with the help of some friends so remember there was that uh, lieutenant uh, from Bacolod. <laughs> he was also the emissary between the American. So that's why, as I've said, it's strange, but he can penetrate Filipino-American lines and to the Japanese lines without being hurt. So it's very, very clear that there must be some kind of mole or, you know, a special alley because uh, the negotiations are very exact, even the timing even the place. Uh, this was without the knowledge of the uh, uh, Filipino commanders. But although uh, in the diaries of the commander, they had they had a hint and uh, they were just surprised that a surrender uh, ceremony will happen in Zambongita. And, and that's the reason why those pictures were actually taken by American forces. Uh, that was given to me by uh, provides uh, donated to Siliman by a a hero also a local hero here uh, Lorenzo Simafranca who was also the one person instrumental in delivering the map of the airport to be sent to Australia so that's why when the American pilots had a bombing run uh, when the airport was really destroyed because they had a a, they had a map. Uh, the story is that this was given to him by the city engineer, Somoza, who actually was executed. He was the city engineer. Uh, he gave Lorenzo this piece of paper. He, he placed it in the seat post of his bicycle and went to the guerrilla position. And of course, the mayor of Dumaguete, uh, Perdices, had knowledge of this whole transaction. So it's actually... A, a, a very long story. So that's it. Uh, so Sir Jewel, uh, that is the reason. Okay, thank you very much, sir. We have a follow-up question from Colonel Judge Rafael Crescencio Tan Jr. He asked, how come we had a hard time defeating the Japanese considering there being not a superior force, sir? Um, if you go to the area, even now, um, they, they really, the Japanese really knew. Uh, the, uh, the first thing that they knew was they found a very nice spot for the last defensive uh, position. And it's on a ridge. And in going to that ridge, there are very few, um, uh, few areas where you can pass. So um, it's, it's this jungle terrain that, and of course, the Americans thought that bombings and artillery fire will destroy the Japanese right away. But uh, again, they were, they were so resilient 
uh, that if you go to the area up to the back of the mountain, uh, you have these dugouts connected with trenches, foxholes, and even up to now, they are still there. So uh, it's really more of the, you know, the how they were able to uh, find a spot for their last stand. And the hand-to-hand -hand fighting was heavy. Even the strategy of putting up suicide squad squads at 300 meters, I mean, about three or 500 meters uh, also was very effective. Can you imagine a platoon of 30 against a squad of five? with eight local guides, still we'll have a hard time. And uh, even at the end of the war, uh, we were told uh, that they only have around 230 rounds. And so <laughs> th th that's, that's it. So by Siguro, by about five months, when they surrendered, uh, there were, uh, according to the, uh, the, the, the diary, uh, there were a lot of surrenderies that had no weapons, uh, no no bullets anymore. Uh, when they surrendered, <laughs> some even did not have rifles. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we would like to uh, once again acknowledge the presence of the Vow Administrator, Yusek Ernesto G. Carolina. Hello, sir. Uh, I think he is still setting up his. Uh, there he is. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to uh, one and all. Uh, by the way, uh, Colonel uh, uh, Rafael Tan has uh, another question, Professor. Uh, I read it in his uh, uh, chat board. Uh, Ito, sir. Yeah, he is asking, uh, kailan ba talaga nangyari yung uh, actual liberation of Negros? Uh, specifically, he was saying, uh, it says here uh, something uh, in your account, but uh, uh, yeah, he was mentioning something that uh, a surrender that happened in September. I think that is in Negros Occidental. Uh, can you can you connect the two uh, uh, the ah. two events from the perspective of the the whole deliberation of the whole Negros Island? Okay, po. Um, iba yung story sa Occidental side. There was a fierce battle of Patag. And then after that, meron din ganito na the Japanese forces went to the hills of Silay. And then later on, they surrendered. Dito sa Negros Oriental naman po, yes, uh, when the American forces arrived, Dumaguete was liberated on April 26. But the Japanese forces were still in the west of the, in the, west of the city. Yun nga, dun nga sa bundok and hold up hanggang nag-surrender sila nung September. So actual surrender of the Japanese was really on September 22, 1945. Oh. Okay. I'm going to try to highlight that, uh, Professor, because, uh, you know, I was assigned in uh, Negros for uh, some years. When I was yes, in the sir. service. Yeah, yeah, I served there, there as battalion commander. Okay. And I, I could recall that... Uh, the, the, the Grenches, the people of Negros, uh, you know, they are very proud people. Okay. And one of their uh, sources of pride is that uh, the, uh, the Japanese have surrendered already to the United States uh, September 2, uh, thereabout, uh, on board the USS uh, Missouri after the capture of General Yamashita mm -hmm. in Luzon. That was September 2. But in Negros, yes, they were, uh, and I think have the, they have the bragging rights. <laughs> they were saying that uh, they were still fighting. So okay. uh, indeed, there is two to their claim that uh, the battle in Negros is the last battle uh, of World War II in the Pacific. Because the... Ah, yung sa, yung sa, yes, yes. Tama yun. Dun sa Patag po. Yes, yes. Tama, yes, sa Patag. Yung yes, yes. Patag was September 22. Di ba? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that's why we are... Uh, Maybe you can assist us in this uh, endeavor from the Akatima, Dr. Leope. We have an ongoing uh, uh, advocacy now to, uh, to have that uh, historical spot in, uh, in Silay. I think that is in Silay, Patag uh, Silay. Oh, yes, yes, pa. uh, yes. To declare sir. that area, to have that proclaimed uh, proclaim by the president, 
as a uh, National Military Shrine. Correct. We Kasi will call it mas, uh, the Battle of uh, Pataga Shrine. Shrine, yes. Uh, it has been donated already by the Hacienda owners. And we're just Opo. working on the papers so that it can be proclaimed by, proclaimed by the uh, by the president, so that we can have uh, not only uh, a monument of amity that you have shown earlier, but we can have a really a, a, a proclaimed national military shrine. Tama in Negros yes, Island. Negros yes, that's, Island. that is correct, sir. In fact, um, may isa akong diary dito, sir, na I I can share it with you. Ito naman yung diary ng uh, officer na naka-assign doon. It's in in the other side. So yeah, it, yeah. this is the Japanese diary. So it will again uh, reinforce. So mag, maganda na, na yung kwento. Uh, mag, ma, yung isa naka-assign doon and mayroon din tayong diary. Uh, yes sir. Sige, I'll just communicate. Bigay ko tong ano, I'll give you a copy of this diary. And uh, I know also professor, uh, maybe the others should know that uh, the university where you are uh, connected, the Siliman University, uh, the ROTC uh, of that oh, university, yes. uh, you know, has uh, produced uh, several uh, heroes in the Second Opo. World War. Yeah, I met some of them, in fact, awarded some of them. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Aldecova, I think, even became a uh, judge. Judge. Justice. 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 Opo. President din siya, sir. Nagiging president sa Siliman. Oh, nagiging president pa ninyo, di ba? Uh, yep, opo, sir. Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, nagiging judge sa Courts of Appeals. Justice. Yeah. Justice. And then justice. Justice. The other justice. one, the other uh, yeah. one uh, he, he died just last year or uh, two years ago. Two years ago. Of, uh, Pomelec uh, Commissioner uh, Rowena Guanson. Judge yes, Cisco sir. Guanson. Yeah, yeah. Opo, a, sir. She's a graduate of... Uh, Siliman University, and uh, he's also a World War II veteran who, who, who fought in uh, uh, in that island during the Second World War. Of course, <laughs> sir. Of course, sir. Lapsede, no? Colonel Lapsede, even uh, after the war, even... He, he was uh, assigned to Korea, sir. To Korea, yeah. Yeah, he's the commander, yeah. he, yeah, he's the commander of one of the uh, battalion combat teams that fought in the uh, Korean War. Nagiging so, under, na under niya, sir, si Lieutenant Fidel Ramos. That's right, that's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was fresh yes, from uh, West Point and he reported yes, to uh, uh, Colonel Lapsede. They were yes, the second sir. battalion uh, that uh, went to uh, Korea to uh, uh, relieve the Trent BCT. city. Yes, Paul. <laughs> uh, General Carolina, sir. Sir, General Carolina, sir. This... Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Colonel Tan, I'm a boy. Yes, sir. Uh, Silliman University ROTC unit was the First, ROTC unit was activated Correct. during the Second World War. Oh, yeah. And now, Siliman has its own ROTC building. And we are planning to have on the left side of the building a wall of fame. Can we ask Piba for help to put up a wall of fame for all these World War II veteran heroes? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can, we send you, can we send you our project proposal, sir? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's why uh, I can went to Professor uh, Cleopi uh, about the past of the Sigma University to, uh, uh, to motivate you to bring that out. <laughs> yes, sir. We have, a, we have a wall that could be made into a wall of fame. We could list down all those World War II veterans. Uh, okay, good, good. Uh, Justice Aldicoa. Aldecoa, Absede. Absede, Absede, was a commander Guanzon. of Siliman. Uh, Guanzon, many others. Uh, we That's have right. already a list of these World War II veterans, including my father uh, and my father-in-law. They were all veterans of World War II. In fact, yeah. I, I just wrote uh, Secretary Lorenzana if uh, he could help us in getting the U.S. Congressional uh, Medal posthumously. I, I sent him an email to awarded during the 75th Liberation Day of Dumaguete, but uh, we did not have any celebration. So I hold the uh, awarding of the, that U.S. Congressional Medal. Maybe I'll, re I'll remind Secretary Lunsana, who was my classmate at PMA. <laughs> so hopefully okay, uh, we, we can celebrate. Uh, 
Okay, yeah, yeah. We have the list already. We have the medals actually, Colonel Tan. Uh, yes, sir. After this uh, COVID, uh, you know, crisis. Kasi hindi tayo makapag face-to-face uh, uh, awarding. awarding. For the awarding. And we were thinking na parang hindi naman meaningful kung mag-award uh, tayo ng uh, virtual. Yes, yes. yes. Kaya sabi namin, hintayin na lang natin yun. But regarding the project that you are proposing, I would uh, recommend uh, Colonel Tan, uh, member ka, na, ka naman ng Veterans Federation, yes, sir. for you to initiate uh, immediately a board resolution of the Veterans Federation so that we can uh, immediately uh, put that into motion. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll do that, sir. We'll do. Eh, so that we can uh, you know, raise the funding and uh, we can communicate already with the uh, authorities uh, sa Tupagete at saka sa Siliman University. Let's yes, start it immediately. Uh, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll... And we will, uh, uh, together, we will uh, work at it. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Work Thank on you. it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And we would also like to recognize the presence of Vice Mayor Justin Gatuslao from Himamarila oh. City, sir. Would you like to add anything to this wonderful conversation? Again, Vice Sir Cleo, okay. good afternoon. Hi, yeah. Justin. Um, Hello, Vice. I, 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 I owe you something <laughs> for <Yeah>. my master. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sir. Yes, uh, Vice. Fascinating, yes, sir. The, um, uh, what you were talking about today, I just wanted to find out, and I put it in the group chat also, if there are any resources, primary resources, on the Japanese experience on our side of the island. Because I supposedly, think right, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Justin. Hamailan is where the guerrilla activities began uh, mm -hmm. in our, on our side of the island. Uh, it's, yes. uh, it's a folklore. We do, not, we do not know if that is actually true. So we want okay. to find out if that is. Okay, sure, sure, sir. Sir Bice, I, I, I will. I will. There, sir, there I, are there are sources. There are there awesome. Are yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you, much. Justin. Take care. Huh? Take care. Thank you very much for that very insightful exchange. Now on to our next question here, uh, sir. How important are monuments of the war in local history? Um, it's really very important because that will help, uh, you know, especially the kids, the younger generations who want some visuals. So monuments, uh, sites, declarations uh, really would uh, kind of uh, make the memory permanent. Uh, ang ano lang dito, the challenge is if there's already a monument, it should be taken care of. Uh, yun lang ang challenge dyan. Uh, I've seen a lot of monuments na wala na. Uh, as soon as it's being erected, that's the end. So local government units and others should, should have a program to commemorate special days in the area also para magiging relevant yung mga ganitong mga ano. Yeah, that's right, uh, Professor uh, Cleopea. You know, uh, the uh, Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, we're, we're trying uh, to change that uh, mindset. Opo, uh, sir. That's right. So we found out uh, when we started uh, including in uh, our budget a portion on uh, what we call uh, soft infrastructure. Because you mm -hmm. know in our country, uh, uh, anything that uh, you need budget, it has to go through uh, the Committee on Appropriations to Congress. Opo. And Opo. when uh, they talk of uh, infrastructure, eh, panayan na sa isip nila MRT, smart globe, uh, <laughs> dam, bridges, etc. No? But in other countries, they have a concept of a so-called uh, soap infrastructure. And this is yes. the uh, love for country infrastructure. As you were saying earlier, uh, propagating the heroic deeds of, uh, you know, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, great uh, moments of uh, a country's history. That is where uh, national sense of pride and love for country uh, is generated. And when you build uh, monuments, battle monuments, uh, war memorials, uh, then you are able to you know, perpetrate 
these are places where you bring the uh, uh, citizens, especially the, the children, so that uh, even a thousand years from now, uh, these people, you know, would remember and they would value, you know, the freedom that uh, they are enjoying and they will fight for it. So, uh, I don't know, other countries uh, uh, relate this to preparing your future uh, defenders, your future, uh, your future veterans. That's why if you go to other countries, you will be amazed uh, in the United States, uh, uh, Arlington, and even their cemetery here, the American cemetery. Mm -hmm. uh, in Australia, the War Memorial, in Korea, in Indonesia, anywhere. But in the Philippines, uh, I think uh, 70 plus years after the war, we have concentrated so much on, you know, uh, economic, uh, you know, uh, recovery, rehabilitation, etc., on this infrastructure. And we forgot, we forgot that uh, the soap infrastructure essential in uh, building discipline, patriotism, love for country in our population. And if you look mm -hmm. around, the, uh, the most progressive nations are characterized by the same, the quality of their population, their, their fierce love for their country. So I think, uh, balik tayo kay Colonel Tan, uh, hindi lamang dyan sa Negros, but uh, you know, we have, we, we are also uh, putting up a uh, battle monument, uh, actually a shrine in uh, Davao, the Battle of Ising Monument. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Where, uh, you know, uh, uh -oh. an old Filipino, an old Filipino, you know, uh, command defeated the Japanese. Uh -oh. And so in uh, Butuan, and so, you know, in all our shrines are in Luzon, as if the war happened only in Luzon. Right. Uh, it's because of MacArthur, there is one in uh, there, there is one in Leyte. But that one is also pathetic because when you go there, it's all about <laughs> MacArthur, the promise of MacArthur. Nobody yes. remembers that when MacArthur returned, he returned together with the uh, uh, the exiled Commonwealth government. Commonwealth government, yes. That's right, yeah, yeah. And for a while, uh, they restored government. Uh, the building was there in Leyte. But mm -hmm. up to this time, when we commemorate uh, October uh, something, 2021 20, or about, it is about mm -hmm. the fulfillment of the promise of MacArthur. Dito, sir, yes, sir, Negro, sir, sa Baiz, yung central, for one month, dito yung seat ng Philippine government before they were whisked to Australia. That's dito right. Sa Dumaguete yeah. by submarine. For one, for one whole month, and dito si Nausmenia, sila lahat. That's right. The, yeah, whole, yeah. the whole government. Communal yeah. government. Oh, and, and all those things will be forgotten if we are not going to put uh, markers, historical markers, uh, battle monument, etc. You know, in 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 the United States, uh, the houses uh, of their generals, you know, where uh, where they live, the house of General Grant, General Lee well, well, in Washington, etc. They, they it, it, it is there, it is maintained. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, they are, these are private uh, shrines or uh, uh, where tourists go, you know, and uh, yes. they mark on the story. But here, uh, here, even the the house of the mother of Jose Rizal has been sold. Kasi, kasi mahal na raw yung lupa. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Professor, uh, uh, I think... Thanks, uh, Thanks uh, yeah, Jen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to put up a syllabus so that uh, this uh, important uh, aspect of our history can be taught. Kasi sa ibang countries, tinuturo nila sa mga bata eh. Sa okay. atin, ang tinuturo lang yung uh, Philippine history ni Agoncillo. So ang mga siga lang doon, sina Antonio Luna, Jose Rizal, yun lang kilala ng mga, <laughs> ng mga anak natin. Ano? And they okay. do not know General Kang Leon, they do not know Absede, they do not know you know all the heroes that we are discussing today. Uh -oh. uh, by okay, the way, General, uh, it might interest you na si uh, Colonel Absede wrote a novel. It's uh -huh. his own story, but it's in a novel. I, I probably, when you visit us, I'll give you a copy. It's a, it's a novel. It's entitled Nita. Pero yung, uh, yung colonel doon, si Nick Tagle, but actually siya yun. It's his ah. life story. Yeah, yeah. He, he wrote a novel. Sige po. Mm -hmm. 
Uh-oh. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor. Yeah. Opo. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question now from Facebook Live. We have Ma'am Hatred Fermantes. She asked, Sir, how true is it that the ruins in Talisay City was burned by the guerrillas during World War II so that the Japanese could not use it as an office? Yes, uh, th- these are these are all these burnings, uh, destruction of buildings are patterns for Japanese retreating forces. Uh, no, for guerrilla forces, I mean. Uh, even be- just before the landing, the Japanese landing, binuborn din yung dinestroy yung mga bridges na mga guerrillas. So, ganun. Uh, maraming stories, a lot of stories all over the country. Uh, these are ano, tactics of the guerrillas to impede, at least hold, at para uh, to also give um, yung Japanese a hard time. So, this also happened in many parts of the country. Also in here in Dumaguete, uh, a lot of buildings were also destroyed by the guerrilla forces. Thank you very much, sir. Next question from S.U. Giovanni Makahid. Where their account or any account were Japanese committee sepoku? Um, thank you, Dr. Makahig. Um, not in the diaries that I've, I've read. Uh, I, maybe in many, but uh, in the diaries, in the papers that I have, uh, uh, I tried to study, uh, the, all these accounts were re- simply a daily, these are like daily logbooks of what they did. And there was no mention of a sipuku or a suicide or a harakiri being performed by a Japanese officer. In fact, uh, most of the officers that sur- who survived surrendered to the American forces. Another viewer would like to know, how did Absede unite the guerrilla band in Negros Island? Um, it was through the intercession of General MacArthur. He sent the Planet Party who landed in Hinubaan by submarine. And, and all the officers realized that uh, Major Jesus Villamor was really sent by uh, MacArthur to once and for all unite. And of course, uh, uh, Colonel Absede was, uh, of course, he was the commandant of Siliman, very efficient, and uh, he commands actually all the respect of the military officers except one. Uh, there was one who really did not obey, but in the end, he also was pitched up. So, but it was it was because of General MacArthur's emissary, Major Jesus Villamor. Okay, we have a comment from Sir Emilio John P. Pagulo. It was in my time when ROTC was an option given to school college offering. I had a wonderful and meaningful training when I was in high school for CAT. I hope it will be back again as a requirement for all students or a special program for any civilian to be trained and formed and ready to any urgent need. Sir, do you have any comments regarding this comment as well? Um, in Siliman, we always support the ROTC. And in fact, of the we offer all the components of NSTP, but it's always ROTC that has the most number. So yes, I agree. Um, of course, uh, Maybe the general, the good general, and Colonel Tan can can probably shed light why it has to be. It should be offered as a mandatory. Maybe see Colonel Tan, can you respond to the comment? Are you around, Pa? Uh, yes, sir. I was trained in ROTC also, so I will be biased. <laughs> but I really believe that ROTC is very important. Uh, in fact, it is our advocacy already to promote the return of mandatory ROTC. But uh, the best way to encourage our students to be in ROTC is simply to avoid what has happened before, which resulted in more of ROTC. This started when uh, one cadet officer in UST was uh, killed because he discovered so many anomalies. So what the armed process of the Philippines can do is to assign good officers 
to handle ROTC. If there are not enough regular officers, maybe they can tap the reservists to handle uh, ROTC. But ROTC in instills patriotism, nationalism, and most importantly, discipline. I was uh, disciplined when I was in the ROTC. Imagine you have to wake up at uh, five o'clock to be on time for a seven o'clock uh, activity. It was in ROTC when we have to learn how to obey without any question because instilled in us was uh, to obey first before we complain. But uh, if you remember the ROTC of World War II, they served honorably our country. And even uh, after World War II, many ROTC graduates served our country to various wars in uh, Korea, in Vietnam, and the wars in uh, the battles in Mindanao. Uh, there were not much uh, officers coming from the PMA, West Point, but most officers served came from ROTC. In fact, there were more reserve officers in the active service than the regular officers who came from the different military institutions, and they served honorably. One graduate of Silliman University who served with distinction, the late uh, Lieutenant General Alfonso Dagudag, was a product of ROTC of Silliman. And so he almost became the commanding general of the Philippine Army, but at least he retired as the commander of the Southern Luzon Command. But in ROTC, you really is you really have this uh, the honor of being taught how to love your country. It was in ROTC that I learned how to love my country, and became a disciplined soldier and a reservist until now. So that's why we, we really advocate for the return of ROTC. Uh, ROTC teaches us many many things, from first aid to radio communication to even management, history, etc. But most importantly, the love for our country. If you go to Siliman, we have different activities. In fact, next week, we are also imitating, and not, and not imitating, but establishing a community pantry. We are now in the process of soliciting uh, donations for the community pantry that will be held at the Yap Hall. Uh, we will be providing uh, goods, for those who need something and can give also something in return. Eggs, sardines. So aside from this uh, patriotic duties of the citizen, we also have these uh, other activities for our cadets. They donate blood. ROTC is the main uh, source of blood donors in Dumaguete City. We always receive texts blood type O, type A needed for a patient at the hospital. So we, we ran to our cadets. Ambassador Corsino uh, was a recipient of a donation from an ROTC sponsor at that. A girl giving blood to Ambassador Corsino twice. Uh, and this girl was a sponsor in the ROTC, willingly donating blood because we have taught them how to love also our fellow men. So marami kang matutunan sa ROTC. Gone are the days when uh, the shenanigans of before nawala na. We strictly follow procedures. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Colonel. And here's another... Uh, he... Okay, so here's another comment from one of our viewers. This is from Lumen Abaygar. It was so amazing hearing some of the personalities who are knowledgeable and sharing their experiences and great wisdom about our topic today. Thanks a lot, sir. Indeed, we are fortunate to have you, sir, today. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And now we have a question from Cavite State University. She is a teacher. Uh, he is a teacher. Okay, he said, I'm interested in the history of Negros because my father was from Seattle. My question is, would it be fair if, when celebrating the Day of Valor, each cities or municipalities would highlight the historical story of their place so that the youth would have ideas of other heroes in the province, like in Visayas or Mindanao, instead of heroes which are only written history books? 
Thank you. Thank you for that co- comment. I'm I'm from Shatton myself. <laughs> But uh actually yeah, ganito 'yan. Um dapat it's very important that uh, at least a person or persons should initiate first the writing of the local history so that there's a basis in celebrating the the you know the gallantry and the valor of these people so uh, apparently that's still a problem um not all towns Cavite has a very good uh, history uh, historiogra- historiographic uh ano uh, that's very good sila pero in many many parts of the country yun pa rin, pa rin ang kulang but uh i suggest na i suggest na they can uh, hindi pa open sa yung pibao natin na archives is it accessible na ba uh, the archives that we have sa pibao or we still have to go to the office yeah. uh, c- can we access na the pibao documents uh, in other words yeah. those digitized pwede na that, that's one pwede, way yeah. we can sir general na open na yung ano yung digitized documents sa uh, although hindi pa siya kumpleto Kasi we discovered there are about eight rooms in the uh, National Archive in Maryland, no? About uh, in the Pacific. Okay. And uh, dalawa pa lang yung panahan natin na team doon, they have brought home siguro mga two-thirds. So meron okay. pang one-third. That's the great. Mga have been brought home are already downloaded in the portal sa Heritage Library, uh, the Ateneo Library. Yes. Uh, UP Library. and uh, Ortigas Library. And uh, we have put up browsing uh, br- browsing rooms in the AP uh, Museum. And uh, available na siya sa, ano, Professor, sa PIVA website. You just, okay. you just type. Yeah. So that, that's great because this will really help. Uh, before kasi, you have to, yung mga important documents, you have to go to that. to the office and to the archive. So that's also one of the reason na yung mga historians natin sa other places nahirapan. But now it's better and then I also would like to ano sir yung sa taga Cavite na uh, tama yung ano mo tama but again uh, hindi hindi maka-celebrate yung area na local area pag walang walang basihan. So maganda yung ginawa na ganito. Hopefully that will be done all over the country. Kaya nga yung project ni na general yung uh, sites, yung mga monuments, very important talaga yon. Kasi hindi ma immortalize yung story at relevance ng mga actions ng ating mga heroes pag wala yan, hindi nila nakakita. Pag story lang. Kaya tama yung soft na ano, infrastructure. That's true, uh, Professor. Uh, karamihan ng istorya natin, ano eh, uh, captured dun sa local level. Yes. So, hala nila tuloy, eh, kwento lang ng mga Ilocano yan, ng mga Ilonggo, etc. And many of these uh, true stories, untold stories, uh, were not written. Uh, usually, nasa diary nung uh, those who fought in those mm-hmm. uh, areas. And mm-hmm. pag namatay sila, binili pa nila sa nila o pag namatay ako isama mo yan sa dibdib ko ha so wala, wala talaga <laughs> wala. Pero, pero ang talagang ano natin ang uh, deficiency uh, y- yung Spanish Revolution maraming record yun eh sa Cavite kaya walang problema doon eh kaya may oh, okay, okay. doon ang problema yung uh-huh. World War II kasi ng okay. World War II uh, dala ng Amerikano lahat diary ng Amerikano, ng Hapon, ng Filipino, okay. etc. And then after the war, as a basis for uh, the giving of uh, benefits, interview nila yan. Yung, ano nila after the war. Dala, dala rin nila lahat yan sa, sa National Archive sa, sa Maryland. Maryland. Yes, Ufi. yes. So, sila may camera eh. Meron na sila yung moving ano. E eh, tayo wala oh. naman. <laughs> yeah, so ang kailangan lang talaga. Uh, so when we discovered that, Uh, we uh, negotiated with them about five years ago. Time ni ano, this Secretary Lorenzana, seven years ago. And we were able to send two teams already to Iskan. So yung first team doon, uh, were there for seven months. Mahirap mm-hmm. din eh, kasi you have to, ido-dorm mo sila doon, 
Mm-hmm. Araw-araw, uh, pupunta sila doon sa archive. And then yung mga equipment, kami mo rin yung scan. One-third, you know? Oh, that's and, great. Uh, so yun, yun ay upload na namin. Yung second uh, mission, dala na rin namin dito. Uh, inaano na nila. Ine-encode. Uh, ina-arrange. Para yun ang susunod na i-upload. Yung next na ipapadala namin na team after the pandemic, uh, para madala na lahat dito so that we can have a complete uh, uh, collection which uh, hopefully yung mga resources ngayon natin, yung mga historians, meron na silang uh, uh, basis to write the uh, story. Kasi ang problema ngayon, yung World War II largely uh, are accounts written by Americans. So yung, yung historia ng World War II largely from the... Uh, from the American, American perspective. perspective. Tama, tama. Right, yeah, yeah. Sige, sir. At saka may mga, may mga areas din, sir, na local that have collections. Sa, sa CPU, andun yung Peralta papers. Sa Silima naman, sir, meron kaming Absede papers. Ah, hindi ito That's na right. turnover. Hindi ito na turnover. So pwede na. <laughs> ah, na-digitize na yun sa amin. I think sa, sa CPU, yung Peralta paper, very significant din yun. Yeah. Oh, wala, no, our uh, what we're trying to uh, arrange is a uh, uh, we sponsor yung scan pag scan so that we can uh, digitize yung records okay. so that uh, we can put a uh, Philippine Center for World War II Studies we're we're, we're putting oh. that that is already uh, in Mount Samat Bataan mm. no? yes a, yes uh, national shrine so magkakaroon tayo doon ng Philippine Center for World War II Studies para yung mga kalat-kalat kasi ano eh scattered yung history natin eh for example the Ayala Foundation no in Makati ang dami nilang records on uh, the Battle for Manila Opo si Roderick Hall has about almost 300 collection of photos yeah. Yes it yes it's a road ang UP ang dami nila about uh, liberation of Luzon etc no yan sa inyo sa Visayas yung UP Iloilo si Professor uh, si Liwayway Mm-hmm. Ang daming, ang kanila, ano, yung liberation of Panay, liberation. Mm-hmm. So, kalat-kalat siya. So, we would like to put all of this together. And uh, at the same time, uh, put up monuments, battle uh, historical sites, uh, war memorials. Para yung Tagalusun makakapunta sa Visayas, makikita niya yung mga lugar na yan. And they will know mm-hmm. the story. Okay. Diba? So hopefully yes, that will uh, together yung sa pinag-usapan natin yung ROTC this would is this would start yung uh, sabi nga investing on human capital uh, preparing our uh, citizens especially the young people to be our future defenders. <laughs> diba? Okay sir. Yes sir. Yeah, sir. Thank you sir. Okay I believe we have uh our last question for today's Q&A. Mas malulupit daw ang mga conscript ng sundalong Koreano sa Japanese Army kaysa sa mga Hapon mismo. Maraming nagsasabi na urban legend lamang daw ito. Ano po ang masasabi ninyo dito? Meron din po bang mga ganitong account sa Digmaan sa Negros, Doctor? Uh, Totoo nga, meron na mga nagsasabing ganun. But uh, in reality, there were no Koreans in the Japanese forces here in Negros. Uh, wala sa kanilang list. Kasi ma-account natin, walang sinasabing mga Koreano. Puro Hapon. At least dito sa side. Maybe, I, I don't know in the other areas. Uh, yeah, pero ang background dyan, uh, Professor, uh, after uh, the Americans uh, took over, mga okay. 18, yeah, early 1900s, eh, di ba? Opo. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, about 1905, the Japanese also uh, colonized Korea. Korea, oh, 1910, 1910 po. 1910, or about. Oh. Apo, yeah, 1910, apo. but 1905, and there was already a UN resolution that allowed them, you know, to uh, to take uh, Korea, Korea a protectorate. Yes. And then in 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 1910, colonized na talaga nila, apo. and so from 1910. Up to 1945, yung end ng World War II. No? So, nung nagkaroon ng World War II, from 1941 to 19, or 1940 to 1945, uh, Korea was already a colony of Japan. And therefore, they were forced, you know, 
uh, a lot of them were conscripted, and many of them mm. uh, were part of the uh, invasion force that went to, uh, you know, Malaysia, Philippines, lalo na sa Pilipinas. Yun yung tinatawag nila mga Kempe Thai, uh, mga Koreano. Mm. And uh, hindi naman talaga mas mabagsik, but uh, uh, I've been talking to the Koreans because they are very close to us now because we sent uh, uh, Filipinos in the Korean War and helped them uh, fight the communists, no? Mm -hmm. They were saying that at that time, you know, these very young Koreans conscripted in the Japanese army, uh, it was uh, against their will. So, galit sila. Oh. Galit sila and uh, it was very possible that uh, they vented this uh, anger to uh, the local population when they were made part of the uh, Japanese army. Part sila ng mm -hmm. Japanese army, pero conscripted. Uh, kaya ang alam natin, ah, ito, ito, mga Hapon. Pero yung pala, Mga ano pala yun, mga Korean. supportive <laughs> boys. Oh, pinwersa nila kasi uh, naging colony nila. Kaya ngayon, kasama okay. natin yung ano, eh, Korea. Uh, galit na galit yan sa hapon when you talk of comfort women, etc. Ah, yes. Kasi talaga, ano, from 19, yun nga, 1910 up to 1945. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh. Pero that is, ano, eh, that is a very uh, interesting part of the story ng World War II. Eh. Hindi na uungkat. It is not Sige. a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that uh, when uh, World War II ended in the Philippines, September 2, World War II ended also. In other words, uh, Korea was also liberated uh, right. from the Japan. In other words, it was the capture of Yamashita. He was captured by uh, Filipino guerrillas, no? Uh, 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 they get the surrender of the uh, uh, of the Japanese because the bomb. Remember the bomb, the atomic bomb was uh, dropped in Hiroshima August six. August, August, yes. August six. Nagasaki was uh, three days after August nine, mm. nineteen forty five. But hindi pa rin na, there were surrender pillars, pero hindi nila maporma to surrender because there were uh, eighty five thousand Japanese army forces. Nadala dala ni Yamashita, who made a land, last stand in northern Luzon. Mm -hmm. And it was in Besang Pass that he was defeated. And uh, thereafter, in Tiangan, that he was captured, captured. by Filipino guerrillas. Eh, ayaw sumurrender sa Pilipino. No, no, I will not surrender to a uh, Filipino, sabi ni Yamashita. So the next day, he was captured September 1. The next day, he was uh, brought to John Hay in Baguio. Awag na ng Amerikano. And he signed the surrender papers. So the Americans wrote the story. The war ended after Yamashita surrendered to the Americans. They omitted the story that he was captured, captured. first. <laughs> after a, uh, you know, after a uh, so many months of battle in Paliti Pass, then uh -huh. Besang Pass, and finally in Tiangan. And then September 2, he signed the papers. The next day, September 2, in the US, the uh, Japanese uh, emperor formally surrendered to MacArthur uh, in Hawaii, di ba? Mm -hmm. In Hawaii. And yung Korea was also liberated. Yun. Uh, so, ganda, ganda, ganda. <laughs> hindi na kito ka nalang story na yun. The, the, the uh, Koreans somehow uh, not only owe us something uh, in the Korean War, but even as far back uh, so, World War II. Uh, during the Second World okay. War. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> By the way, uh, by the way, uh, I think he's here. Uh, he's married to a uh, to a uh, his wife is from Silay. Mm. Silay, I know that for a fact. So, baka may tanong si Engineer Ray Carolina. He is uh, he has not been in the Philippines for a long, long time, uh, <laughs> and the wife is a proud uh, Negrense. And uh, utol. Uh, uh, Professor Triope is the expert about the history of the war in, uh, in Negros. Baka meron kang tanong. <laughs> I don't know if he's still around. Uh, opo, opo. Okay lang. I saw, I saw him in the list. Okay, okay. Sige, please proceed. Please proceed, guys. Ah, ito pala. Ito pala. Sige. Engineer Ray Carolina. Oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Already, I was telling them that uh, your wife is from uh, uh, from Silai uh, Negros, and uh, the last battle. Mm -hmm. so I was asking, "What are you talking about, Professor Jope? He's the guy." Okay. Okay. <laughs> no question. <laughs> Hey, sir, the engineer. Wala naman daw sa presyo, no? Okay. Ni Mrs. Ni Shady sa kanya. Okay, thank you very much, sir. And I think that's all of our questions for today. And we are now officially closing our open forum. Okay, thank you very much, everyone for participating in our Q&A and for sending in your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Cleope, for responding to our questions. As we now near the end of our program, let us have PIVAO Administrator Undersecretary Ernesto G. Carolina for his closing remarks. Good day to all of you. I'm elated to know that uh, after five webinars, we are still going strong and our participants are increasing each webinar episode. This proves just how much our countrymen crave for uh, stories that center on our valiant heroes and the events that led to the liberation of our country during the Second World War. In today's webinar, we take joy and pride in relieving the courageous and daring narratives of our Filipino guerrillas and war veterans. After all, knowing their stories and revisiting their feats during the Second World War is one way of honoring their service to the motherland. One of uh, the victories of our veterans during the Second World War that needs our uh, appreciation happened in Negros Island. The success of the resistance uh, in Negros against the Japanese uh, Imperial forces was made possible because of the emergence of the early guerrilla organization in Negros Island and uh, the subsequent collaboration of the Filipino guerrillas and American soldiers. The battle between the Japanese and the Filipino guerrillas at Mount Silai lasted for more than three months until the invaders finally showed signs of a defeat that eventually led to the surrender of General Kono. This was followed by uh, succeeding waves of uh, surrender of uh, roughly 13,500 Japanese soldiers leading to the liberation of Negros Island on September 9, 1945. The Battle of Negros was preceded by the Battle of uh, Patag, said to be the last battle of uh, World War II in the Pacific. Some historical accounts may be less known to others, but all the feats of our uh, veterans redound to the liberation of our country. As such, all the heroic deeds of our veterans in the past uh, uh, are stories that need to be highlighted today. Their heroism, depicted both in their uh, sacrifices and victories, is a tale all of us should remember. And their valor is a guiding light we all need to follow, especially during this dark times. Before we close today's webinar, allow me to take this uh, opportunity to thank our resource speaker, Dr. Earl Jude Paul uh, Cleope of uh, Sidiman University for sharing with us his knowledge on the events that transpired in Negros during the Second World War. Your lecture truly instilled in us 
a sense of uh, kagitingan and love of country. Allow me also to thank all our participants who join us in today's webinar. We hope to see you again in our upcoming webinar series. Muli, mabuhay ang ating mga veterano, mabuhay ang Pilipinas. Thank you very much, Undersecretary Carolina. Before we officially begin our, our end our program, we may now uh, have our photo op. So we invite everyone of our um, participants to please turn on your cameras as well as our resource speaker for our photo op. Please turn on our camera. Okay. Now let's. Okay, for the first photo. And again, for another photo. And again, for another photo. And for another photo. Okay. That's it. Once again, for those who were able to pre-register, we will be sending a link to your email tomorrow. Kindly accomplish the evaluation form. You will be receiving your e-certificate after a day. Also, we are inviting everyone to our next episode on May 6, 2021. We will have Miss Marie Silva Vallejo, who will be presenting the Battle of Eating. Okay. That concludes the sixth episode of our Kagitingan webinar series. We thank everyone for joining us this afternoon, and we hope to see you in the next one. I am Nico Oreiro. And I am Felicia Lois Lanya. We have been your hosts for today. Thank you, and good afternoon. Oh,